We arrested some terrorists yesterday, and it found it turns out they crossed the border illegally. Turns out that Biden's ICE department actually held them, but then released them. And the media, the Democrats, Joe Biden, they still want you to think that this whole idea of terrorists crossing our border illegally to do us harm, that's that's a myth. That's a fake story. Well, we'll give you the details on it. Oh, they also want you to think that there's no voter fraud in America, except, you know, that woman just got arrested yesterday for stuff in the ballot box. She's a Democrat, too. We'll give you those details. And Joe Biden is really angry at you for wanting to maintain your Second Amendment rights for self-defense, for protection. He doesn't want you to have guns. And if he has to take an F-16 to mow you down to prove it, well, then he will. That's a good reason to have a gun, isn't it? We got all that and a whole lot more. We're brought to you by the Iconic Payments Coalition. My name is Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. That's right. Yesterday, we had uh, nine terrorists arrested. They're affiliated with ISIS. They're also Russian nationals, which I've been told Russia is the biggest threat on American soil or around the world. So you would think that uh, Joe Biden would be interested in making sure Russians didn't come here illegally to do us harm. Here's how CBS reported it to their viewers. Eight individuals, all from the Central Asian country of Tajikistan, were arrested in Los Angeles, New York, and Philadelphia. They entered the United States this year and in 2023, crossing the Mexican border. They were vetted and allowed to remain in the country. CBS News has learned further investigation uncovered the men had possible ties to ISIS-K, the terror group which claimed responsibility for an attack at a Moscow concert hall that killed more than 140 people earlier this year. My favorite part of that report, I think, is when they say they were vetted. They were vetted, by the way. Got a clean bill of health. Also, Tajikistan. Is that is that one of the countries that Hunter Biden made a lot of money for by selling access to his dad? Yeah, eight terrorists arrested. They're from Russia. And they were held and vetted by Biden's Department of Homeland Security. But let's face it, what kind of vetting can you do when you're dealing with millions and millions of people illegally crossing the border? You know, we've got over 4,000 a day coming across. They just made this fake threshold of 2,500 a day, and that's when they're going to cut it off. And that, of course, they haven't cut anything off. In fact, new reports show that 72% of those apprehended at the southern border in San Diego, California, have been released back into the country. That's after Joe Biden decided to crack down. But he's not really cracking down. It's just a talking point for the campaign. And, of course, for for months, for years, we've been saying that this border issue is a national security problem. We don't know who's coming across the border. And in light of the October 7th terror attacks, how do we know that this isn't going to happen here at any moment? It's a ticking time bomb. That's why this story is so important. And while there's some journalists who are actually covering it, like at Fox Business. Senator Mike Lee, Republican from the state of Utah, joins me now. Mr. Senator, you have a bill to ban TSA from accepting the Border One app. Well, one of the terror suspects from Tajikistan used that app to get into America. Why do you want to stop the TSA accepting that app? TSA shouldn't be accepting that app as a form of ID because it requires no valid ID. All you have to do is fill it out, put in whatever name, whatever biographical information you choose to. Then you can get into the country, just like this terrorist got into the country last year. Uh, let me we're going to let Senator Lee finish here, but I just want to make sure that everybody understands what's going on here. See, it's this app that. Uh, the, the Border Patrol allows to be used. They've been told by the Biden administration to allow people to use this app that basically they self puts information in and then they use it for identification. You're supposed to trust what it says and then they're let into the country. But as if that's not bad enough, this is what Senator Lee's talking about. You can then board a plane with it. That's not a government issued ID. It's a self issued ID. It's like you taking a piece of paper and writing a name and address a birth date on it and putting in a fake number with a little hand drawing of yourself and then walking to TSA and say, here, here's my ID. There's really no difference except it's on a fancy app. So not only are these illegal immigrants crossing the border and getting into the country utilizing this app, but they could be linked to terror organizations, as in the case of these eight, and then they can be on the plane seat next to you. 
Have we have we learned nothing? Have we learned nothing from September 11th? Or from October 7th, for that matter? This is Joe Biden's America. This is Alejandro Mayorkas's Department of Homeland Security. I don't feel very secure in this homeland knowing all of this. Do you? Senator Lee continues here. This terrorist who's now been arrested. You know, what's really scary is that we don't know anything about the other hundreds of thousands of people who have gotten in using the CBP-1 app. Uh, this one in particular we know is a terrorist. How many other terrorists are there out there, Stuart, who got into yeah. the, co the country the same way using the app? So you're aiming for security here. But what you would also do, you would be to cut down on the number of people who'd just be flying around the country, the number of migrants flying all over the place. You want to cut that down and improve security. That's the, the, the basis of this. Yes, that's the basis of it. What the ballot act says is that you cannot use the CBP-1 mobile app uh, either to enter the United States as a form of ID accepted by the Department of Homeland Security or, or alternatively uh, to fly from one U.S. city to another. You know, U.S. citizens... When they board a plane in Denver, bound for Salt Lake City or anywhere else, they have to present a valid form of ID. Likewise, when a U.S. citizen leaves the country, they've got to have a passport so that they can get back in. Illegal aliens don't have to produce either one. All they need is access to a phone and the CBP-1 mobile app, and they can enter in whatever they want. All right. Uh, that's a good place to pause, too. We will let you finish. I know you're in mid-breath there, Senator Lee. Nice screen grab there, Larry. Sorry about that. Think about this for a minute. You, I'm guessing, you are not a terrorist. You, or your spouse, or your child, or your grandparent, for that matter, you're not terrorists, and you don't do any harm. You don't plan to cause any harm to our nation. If you're getting on a plane to go visit family or maybe go on your vacation this summer, your intentions are not to commandeer that plane and kill innocent lives with it. And yet... Think about what you have to go through to get on that plane. Think about the near strip search you have to endure, the the almost deep body cavity probe that goes into the screening process when you, the innocent person, and your spouse and your children and your grandparents get on that plane to go down and visit the Magic Kingdom or something. Think about all of the rigmarole you do by taking your shoes off and making your kids take their shoes off and taking your computer out of your bag and uh, get, get, getting seen by infrared cameras that basically show your naked body while you're standing there and TSA agents are chewing their gum and talking to each other about when their next coffee break is and then delaying your access to your gate and to your flight. Think about all of that that you go through right now, and you mean no harm. And yet, people who come into the country illegally, who very well could be affiliated with terrorist organizations, they go to the airport, they flash this app that our government has issued them that has no actual government vetting process, and they get to get on the plane. They get to get on the plane and sit right next to you. How annoyed are you? How outrageous is this? And we just arrested eight of them for affiliations with ISIS. ISIS, remember them? I thought well, they were done. No. They were done back during the Republican presidency of Donald Trump. Now ISIS is back, baby. Thanks, Joe Biden. The Valid Act would end both uses that I just described and therefore make our country safer. What kind of support do you have for this in the Senate? You know, Republicans are very supportive. And I offered this up. This is the kind of bill that really ought to pass unanimously. Keep in mind, Stuart, that uh, the Democrats have been insisting over and over again uh, that the need for the Valid Act uh, just didn't exist because, as they put it, it's not being abused. It's being utilized properly. Uh, nobody's getting in who shouldn't be. Some even claimed that it wasn't uh, a substitute for a valid form of ID. All of that is untrue. And it's been proven yet again untrue uh, by our discovery of this known terrorist who we now know got into the country using the CBP-1 app. Mr. Senator, thank you very much for being with us today. Lots of good stuff on the table, and we appreciate your covering for it. That's right. We appreciate it, too. Um, but I'm going to have to do my due diligence here as a responsible journalist in the media world over here at Town Hall. I got to give full disclosure because Senator Mike Lee there just made the allegation 
that with our open borders and lack of security and our inability to properly vet people on our southern border or anywhere, really, as people are illegally entering our country and allowed to remain, that in some way he believes, he said, allegedly, supposedly, reportedly, that terrorists have gotten into this country. Uh, this, of course, after the eight arrests of ISIS-affiliated illegal immigrants who crossed the border and were allowed to roam free. Uh, he reached the conclusion that, hey, maybe terrorists have crossed our border. And I'm sorry, as a responsible journalist, I have to echo what The New York Times said when Governor Ron DeSantis made the same allegation during a Republican debate. You see, quote, if you look at the threats that we face, terrorists have come in through our southern border, unquote. And according to The New York Times at the time during that debate, they said this is false. It's false to say that terrorists have come in through our southern border. It's false. I mean, maybe they'll revise this now. Is since eight people were arrested yesterday. Can I repeat that? Eight people have been arrested as terror affiliates with ISIS who had come into the country from the southern border. And by the way, the New York Times extrapolated on their fact check. Since 1975, no one has been killed or injured in a terrorist attack in the United States that involves someone who came across the border illegally, according to Alex Nauriste, Vice President of Economic and Social Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. Oh, good old Cato. They hate borders. They love that cheap labor, even if it means letting a terrorist in. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, 9-11 happened. No one has been killed or injured in a terrorist attack in the United States since 1975 for someone who came across the border illegally? What? We know for a fact that the terror terrorists for 9-11 were in the country illegally. What's that all about? Oh, <laughs> see, you're not smart enough to work at the New York Times. Sure, sure, sure. The 9-11 terrorists killed 3,000 people in 2001, the single worst terrorist attack in the history of the planet right here in America, but they didn't cross the southern border, you see. They came into the country, they overstayed their visas. Yes, they were here illegally, but Ron DeSantis specifically said our southern border, and they did not cross the southern border. Look at me, I work for the New York Times. These aren't serious people we're dealing with here. Not serious at all. And this is the most serious situation you can think of. Americans are going to die because of the lack of security. Right now, this president not taking the single function that he's got as a leader of a nation, which is to protect that nation's borders. He refuses to do it. And yesterday's arrest shows us exactly the dangers that we're dealing with. Congressman Tom McClintock, California. He uh, comes from California, so he knows a little thing or two about border security and illegal immigration. We've had 5 million illegal immigrants deliberately released into our country with very limited vetting. Um, and while the Border Patrol has been overwhelmed, another 2 million known godaways have entered as well. Now, last year, your FBI director uh, told this committee that he believes this constitutes a massive security threat. Again, his words. Do you agree with that assessment? I'm, I'm, I'm never going to be disagreeing with the FBI director, but um, my recollection, he said that there is a national security threat of people um, from known terrorist organizations what? crossing the what? border. Right. Of course, it's a threat. And now we've seen the actual fruits of it and understand something. Uh, you know, well, they were vetted and they, were, they weren't on anyone's list. So we just let them go. You know, if, if you're a terrorist mastermind sitting over there in your evil lair in the Middle East and you want to do harm to innocent Americans and you know that we're not protecting our southern border or doing anything to vet anybody, are you going to send someone named um, Ahmed Abdul Kaboom who, you know, has a face tattoo that says kill the Jews and Americans? that has a, a track record of being arrested, trying to smuggle bombs onto planes that can easily be brought up on any sort of international crime database. Is that who you're sending? Or are you going to find somebody who has a pristine record, who's already been trained, who already knows what to do, and who's just going to keep to themselves until they're told to execute literally the plan. So stop with the whole, Oh, sure. It's a threat, but we're vetting everyone. And they did, you know, they passed the, the clean bill of health. No, 
Of course they passed a clean bill of health. They're sending terrorists here who aren't going to get stopped. The only way to truly protect us is to not have a border that's wide open, allowing thousands of people a day to come in here without even so much of signing the guest book on their way in. And this ridiculous mobile app is no form of vetting and no form of proper ID. Representative Mark Green also concerned about it, and he had his moment at a hearing. Director Ray, um, since January of 2021, approximately 1.8 million illegal alien gotaways have evaded Border Patrol and entered our country. And this doesn't even account for the unknown gotaways, which former Border Patrol Chief Raul Ortez testified before this committee could be about 20% of that number, meaning the real number of gotaways is well over 2 million. Can the FBI guarantee the American people that known or suspected terrorists, including any from Hamas or other terror groups, are not amongst those gotaways? Well, certainly the, the group of people that you're talking about are a source of, of great concern for us. That's why we're aggressively using all 56 of our joint terrorism task forces. And there, but there's really no way for you to guarantee that Hamas isn't in those. Well, I, again, the, as you say, there's the unknown unknown and the known unknown. Right. Um, but what I can tell you is that our 56 joint terrorism task forces are working their tails off to make sure that they suss out and identify potential terrorist suspects, whether they're on the watch list or not. You think that number, that increased number, uh, increases the threat to the American citizens? I, I think anytime you have a, a group of people in the United States that we don't know nearly enough about, uh, that is a source of, of concern for us from a perspective on our, in our lane of protecting Americans here. So wording it maybe another way, if it were lower, if that number were lower and the border wasn't as open as it is, and we'd be safer. I think greater fidelity about who's coming in this country and how they're getting in uh, is essential to yeah. making sure we protect Americans from, from all sorts of threats, including a potential terrorist attack. Yeah, I do too. Yeah, um, I'll translate. We are less safe right now because Joe Biden is president and because he has neglected border security. Uh, however, again, in the same way that I had to be a responsible New York Times approved journalist and correct the record there in that there are no terrorists that have been arrested crossing our southern border. I also have to point out that all this talk about about people from the Middle East and other foreign countries looking to do us harm, these Russian nationals who are from Tajikistan affiliated with ISIS that have now been arrested potentially with a plot of uh, bombing innocent Americans and all this talk about Southern border, it might conjure some uh, inappropriate or misleading images for you to think that we have a terror threat coming from people who are, how do I put it, who are not white. And uh, and so that's where the responsible journalist in me comes in. I gotta I gotta do a Don Lemon here for you. Because everybody knows that the greatest threat to the American public and our peace and security in our nation comes from white Christian men. Just wanted to set the record straight there. Everything else is fine. Now, be afraid of me. Can your retirement and your savings weather an economic storm? Have you considered this? Have you thought about it? Think about it for a minute because... With what you put away from the future, for the future, uh, in like cash, is it safe from an economic storm? Inflation can render cash worthless. We've learned this over the last couple of years. Real estate, is that where your money is? Well, real estate can crash like it did in 2008. Economies built on a mountain of debt can fall like a house of cards. There are very few physical assets they can invest in. They can stand the test of time. Gold, however, well, that's something different. Gold has withstood as a valued form of money for millennia. It's why people are flocking to it now and why Birch Gold is busier than ever. Through a little no tax loophole, Birch Gold will let you convert a retirement account into a tax sheltered IRA in physical gold. And the best part is it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. To learn more, text Larry to 989898 and claim your free info kit on gold. I'll ask again, can your IRA or 401k weather an economic storm? If not, 
Call the people I trust. Call Birch Gold. Text them right now. Larry to 989898 and secure your savings today. Well, fresh off the news of his son being convicted on federal gun charges, Joe Biden delivered a speech to every town for gun safety. Wait, that can't be right. Are you serious? Wait, isn't that the Moms Demand Action? That's that's a big Bloomberg-funded anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment gun control place. They're well, surely they canceled this invitation the day they found out that his son was guilty of violating the very laws that they forced onto the books, right? In fact, it's one of the most common. Usually their, their uh, gun control laws are not common sense. But this one actually was. You don't want a drug addict to going out and getting a 38 special. I mean, they might do God knows what with it. They might leave it in a trash can across the street from a high school so somebody can take it and shoot up some innocent students, right? That's exactly what this group is opposed to. Okay. Joe Biden went ahead and delivered his remarks there anyway. That must have been awkward. Here's what jo- a couple of things that Joe Biden had to say to the anti second And let's just be clear here. All of the laws that this group tries to cram down your throats are designed to tick you off. They're divine. They're they're just designed to divide us. These groups don't really care about gun safety. Um, if they did, they would not back the party that doesn't prosecute crimes involving guns. If they cared about safety in our streets, they wouldn't back the party who has been opening up the jails and letting people out scot free. This is about dividing us. This is about political power. And it's about making you angry. That's what Joe Biden does. That's what these groups do. So he took a show on the road after his own son violated federal gun laws and was convicted. And he addressed the moms who demand action. I've attended too many mass shootings. I've gone to too many schools across America. Joe Biden has attended too many mass shootings. Now, we're going to give you lots of examples of Joe Biden's brain being made up of mashed potatoes. But just understand, it's really just a stutter. He's really just struggling with a strutter, like like in this case. Who in God's name needs a magazine which can hold 200 shells? Who? Need, who in God's name needs a magazine that can hold 200 shells? By the way, usually, sometimes it's 100, sometimes it's 30, sometimes he calls it a clip. But this time, it's a, it's a great combination. I, whenever he speaks like this, I have, you know, I, I have a vision of Cam Edwards, our, our pal in Town Hall, who runs uh, Bearing Arms. He's a firearms expert, gun law expert. I, I, I just imagine him turning red and screaming back at the television. Who in God's name needs a magazine that holds 200 shells? Who in God's name needs a magazine which can hold 200 shells? The, the straw men who are being held up to be burned in effigy at this event is uh, very well, I think there's going to be a run on straw in the Midwest. Uh, farmers better beware. Here's another. You can't be pro-law enforcement and say you are pro-law enforcement and be pro-abolishing the AFT. You can't be pro-law enforcement and be pro-abolishing the AFT. Well, the AFT is the American Federation of Teachers. That's Randy Weingarten's uh, teachers union. And I can tell you that I am, in fact, pro-law enforcement. And I'm also in favor of abolishing Randy Weingarten's teachers union. So that's just fact check false. However, uh, remember, the president has mashed potatoes for brains, and I'm pretty sure what he meant was the ATF, not the AFT. But that doesn't matter. They'll give him a standing ovation anyway. Instead of trying to stop our ban on ghost gun kits that contain these, that can commit crimes, they're working like hell to, to stop it. 
I'm not sure what just happened. This is, again, one of those malfunctions where the wires are crossed. Somebody rebooted him backstage in the middle of a sentence. If you can work this out, please leave it in the comments below. What exactly is he saying here? Just as a public service for everyone else watching the video, you tell me, what's your best guess? What is he saying here? Instead of trying to stop our ban on ghost gun kits that contain these, that can commit crimes, they're working like hell to, to stop it. It's just a stutter, guys. His brain is functioning top notch. Don't believe what the Wall Street Journal said. He's, he's the most brilliant, articulate president. It's just a, it's a minor stutter. He's struggled his whole life with it. You want more? We got more. I was no longer the vice president. I became a professor at the University of, of um, Pennsylvania. Before that, I taught a constitutional law class. And so I taught the, the Second Amendment. There's never been a time that says you can own anything you want. And never. You couldn't own a cannon during the Civil War. <laughs> No, I'm serious. Think about it. How many times you hear this phrase? The blood of liberty. Wash it, though. Give me a break. Okay. This one's worth a full breakdown and analysis. I let you see all 27 seconds without breaking. Now we got plenty of things to discuss. Let's start it from the beginning again, shall we? Hold my hand. Let's walk down the lane of Joe Biden's dementia. I was no longer the vice president. I became a professor at the University of, of um, Pennsylvania. He was never a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He was paid by the University of Pennsylvania. By the way, coincidentally or not so coincidentally, the University of Pennsylvania also got huge gifts from the Communist Chinese Party. Were there strings attached? And was some of that money designed specifically to flow to the big guy? Only time and a few more cleverly placed subpoenas will tell, but he was never a professor and he never taught a class. Before that, I taught a constitutional law class and so I taught the, the Second Amendment. He never taught a constitutional law class, ever. Ever. There's never been a time that says you can own anything you want. Actually, there was a time where you could own anything you want. Now, maybe he's saying uh, since the formation of the United States of America and the federal government that we now live under, maybe. But when we were colonies, you certainly could own whatever you want. Uh, and by the way, the point he's about to make is also fake, but we'll let him make it first. Never. You couldn't own a cannon during the Civil War. You could own a cannon during the Civil War. You could own a cannon during the Revolutionary War. In fact... You can own a cannon today. He says this all the time. He repeats it over and over again. He has been fact-checked up his skinny little wazoo, and he still says it, unchecked, unchallenged. There's no one in his inner circle who says, sir, just stop saying that. It's just false. You can own a cannon. Go get one. They're fun. No, I'm serious. Think about it. How many times you hear this phrase? The blood of liberty. Wash it, though. Give me a break. I think what he's saying is the tree of liberty is watered with the blood of tyrants. That's how Thomas Jefferson phrase it. He can't even say it properly. But that's your president. And by the way, he's mocking anybody who believes in the constitutional right to self-defense and to bear arms. And he's making fun of you and... Uh, ridiculing you. Remember when I said these groups exist to divide us? It's made to order for this guy because his whole political career has been about dividing us. You know, you got to hand it to Barack Obama, at least with his radical positions on guns. And he had the same radical positions that Joe Biden has. At least he made an effort. You know, he put on the mom jeans and go to Camp David and shoot skeet, you know? He, he he at least attempted to pander to you. This guy, he holds you in such contempt, with in such venomous contempt, that he gets off on pissing you off. He enjoys it. And it's really the only way he can solidify his political base, is to continue to divide us. 
See, the more united we are in this country, the more irrelevant people like Joe Biden are. And so that's why this place is, this is where he's going to thrive. Which brings us to the piece de resistance, the thing that he loves to say all the time when he's making fun of you as a uh, gun owner and a proud advocate of the Second Amendment. By the way, if they want to think to, is to take on government, if we get out of line, which they're talking again about, well, guess what? They need F-15s. They don't need a rifle. Okay. Let's break this down a little bit. Uh, first of all, it's a complete misconception when he says, you know, people have to have, they say they have to have guns to, to keep the government in check if we ever get out of line. That, that's not exactly the correct characterization. But I will say this. Uh, one of the reasons why we have had such a stable government for nearly 250 years now in this country is because whatever government is in power at any given time, they know that they have an armed citizenry. They also, up until a very short time ago, had a citizenry who were well uh, trained and well uh, familiar with the military because so many of Americans had been participants in the military or had family members in the military. That's not actually common in other countries, less stable countries. Neither of those things are true in other stable countries. By the way, uh, in terms of gun ownership, keeping the government in line, uh, all you have to do is read the Federalist Papers. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton were pretty clear about this being a fundamental element as to why the Second Amendment was necessary. Not some fringe benefit, not a good idea, necessary for the formation of our government. Now, you may not like that. I, I do love how Democrats and liberals, they love the, the hip-hop rapping Latino Alexander Hamilton on Broadway. But when they actually see the real-life Alexander Hamilton, you know, not their favorite guy. But, but like it or not, that's why we have a Second Amendment in the first place. I, I got to say, I, I have grudging respect for Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. He hates you. He hates guns. He hates the Second Amendment, but he doesn't try to do this. He doesn't try to mock you for actually having a true, honest and educated understanding of the Second Amendment and why it was put in place in the first place and why it must remain. Gavin Newsom knows that. He acknowledges it. He's the only one out there saying, let's repeal the Second Amendment. I mean, that truly is. It's never going to happen. But that truly is the only intellectually honest position to take, not these people who try to craft laws to make you, the law-abiding gun owner, have to conform to their tyrannical uh, regulations that they try to put in place. The criminals aren't going to follow those laws. Let's face it. They're trying to stop murders in this country. So what are they going to do? They're going to put in more regulations and more laws against owning guns. But they can't outlaw owning a gun because they acknowledge the Second Amendment exists. So instead, they put in all of these regulations and provisions that make it harder to get a gun. And who does that affect? It affects the law-abiding citizens who will actually give a crap about not wanting to break these laws that they pass. But see, <laughs> the criminals, they don't care about these new laws. They're more than happy to break these new laws. You know why? Because they're criminals. If they're willing to break the law against, I don't know, murder, then maybe they're going to break the law against lying on a form to get a new gun or a waiting period for getting a new gun or whatever other stupid idea they have. Gavin Newsom's the only one who's actually being honest out there that says, yeah, we got to repeal the Second Amendment. OK, bring it on. Let's have that debate. Let's see how the American people will reward you. But back to Joe Biden here, because what he's doing is, first of all, uh, setting up a straw man. He is making a uh, ridiculing caricature of over half of this country who believe in the Second Amendment and believe that gun ownership and the right to bear arms is critically important to the security of our nation. And he is mocking you in the most despicable and divisive way. Once again. By the way, if they want to think to, is to take on government, if we get out of line, which they're talking again about, well, guess what? They need F-15s. They don't need a rifle. And this last point that I want to make, because I wanted to show it to you one more time, 
is probably the most disturbing of all because he's mocking the idea that the American people will keep their government in line through personal gun ownership and the right to bear arms in one's own home. He's mocking that idea by reminding you that if Joe Biden, as president of the United States and commander in chief, wanted to, he could just order F-16s to mow you down. I, I don't think that's the best way to assuage American citizens who feel sometimes that they're actually the enemy of their own government because of their own political philosophies, philosophies and political views. You know, if you're trying to tamp down hostilities in this country and paranoia and anger between the divisive political body politic that you have helped create, maybe, just maybe, you shouldn't raise the specter of F-16s being ordered to murder innocent citizens. But Joe Biden doesn't think in those terms. Joe Biden thinks in terms of furthering the divisions in this country and reminding you that he's got control of the jets. One other thing, this is a fundamental misunderstanding and disrespect of the American military. Because see, to order that F-16 to mow you down, it would require a, a pilot, a pilot from the United States Navy or Marines or Air Force to get behind the stick of that F-16 and to follow an order that was given to him to go and kill innocent Americans. And see, one of the reasons why having the Second Amendment and the right to bear arms and an armed citizenry is important is because usually the kids who grew up in households that had guns and had a respect for firearms and the notion of our Constitution, those are the kids that grow up and end up joining the military. And that kid ordered behind uh, into the cockpit of an F-16 to murder an American citizen, that kid probably is somehow related to that American citizen or at least sees his own parents in that American citizen's eyes. Hate to tell you this, Joe, but that ain't going to happen. You're on the wrong side of this one, typically on the wrong side of it. By the way, Joe Biden was uh, delivering these remarks to this anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment group just moments after his son got convicted on federal gun charges. He was delivering these remarks while at the very same time over at the White House, just down the street from this conference, Karine Jean-Pierre was set to give a press briefing and answer questions from the media about those convictions. And then this happened. Kayla Tashi live for us at the White House. Kayla, we'll let you get to that press briefing that was obviously delayed by the president's uh, remarks. Uh, it actually just got canceled. Yeah, we just yeah. learned that. Whoops. Briefing canceled after the president's son was convicted. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to take a quick break. <laughs> I do love it when the CNN anchors learn news from reading the monitor in their own studio on the Chiron. Yeah, it's shocking that Karine Jean-Pierre would cancel that briefing. Let's think of some of the questions that could have been asked. Uh, for years, the president has said that his son did nothing wrong. Now, should he revisit that? Did he always knew that he did something wrong, except he was lying on behalf of his son to the American people? Or is the president surprised that a jury has convicted his son? In fact, does the president disagree with what the jury concluded here, considering He's always said his son did and nothing wrong. Does he agree now that maybe his son did do something wrong? Actually, Corrine, forget that question. I've got another question. The key most important piece of evidence in the conviction of Hunter Biden was the laptop. The Justice Department, Joe Biden's Justice Department, entered that laptop in as a key piece of evidence. The jury found it to be compelling, and they used that evidence to convict Hunter Biden. So since the president said during a debate two weeks before the election that that laptop was Russian disinformation, does he stand by that statement? And given the fact that his Justice Department used that laptop as evidence to convict Hunter Biden, 
can we now look at all of the other things that are on that laptop that are way more important and way more dangerous to the American people and implicate the big guy, President Biden? Can we look at all that evidence now? Or is that stuff still Russian disinformation? Karine, have you got an answer? Do you have something on your cross tabs there in the book about that? Anything? Anything at all? I guess now we know why they canceled that press conference. Millions of Americans rely on points and miles and rewards from their credit cards. Corporate megastores want to take those rewards away. These are rewards that we use on groceries, school supplies, cash back to save on gas and grow our small businesses, travel miles that we use to make memories. The Durbin Marshall credit card bill would eliminate credit card rewards. No more travel miles, no more cash back. When lawmakers help corporate megastores line their pockets, American families pay for it. Tell your senator to oppose the Durbin Marshall credit card bill. Visit handsoffmyrewards.com to take action today. That's handsoffmyrewards.com. Well, you've heard it over and over and over again. There is no voter fraud in America. We have the safest, most secure elections anywhere in the world. That's why we were shocked to see Jesse Waters last night deliver this report. Wanda has been arrested. The Democrat operative who was caught on camera allegedly stuffing ballots in Bridgeport, Connecticut last year was charged with unlawfully possessing another person's ballot and witness tampering. But this has nothing to do with her alleged stuffing in 2023. This goes all the way back to 2019. Wanda was arrested for ballot fraud in the city's 2019 Democrat primary for the same candidate she helped elect in 2023, Mayor Joe Gannam. Wanda's accused of filling out someone's absentee ballot, telling them to not vote in person, and then asking them to not tell investigators about what she said. Wanda isn't the only Democrat arrested for fraud. Three other Bridgeport Democrats were charged. One of them's a city councilman. Wanda's been suspended with pay from her city job for months. She works for the front desk for the mayor that she got into office. <laughs> Fox 61 reporter Matt Karen paid Mayor Joe a visit today. Watch this. We'd like to talk with the mayor about some of the city workers being arrested for election fraud. Hi, I'm Martin. I'll be right with you. Thanks. We waited. Fast forward. Mayor Ganim didn't want to talk to us, but his 2019 and 2023 mayoral opponents did. I always felt like I had been cheated. Uh, I didn't know the depth of it. We caught it live on video directly from City Hall. The players and the actors remain the same. Both Marilyn Moore and John Gomes say they believe they should be occupying Bridgeport's corner office. Well, actually, I'm going down the City Hall until Joe Ganim get out of my chair. Hmm. <laughs> Candidates were cheated. Voters don't trust the system. This is why you need squeaky clean elections every time. We need every Wanda locked up before November. Yeah, she, he's 100% right. And, and for those of you who are saying, well, see, see, okay, well, at least we got some arrests here. Uh, that means the system works. The rule of law works, right? They cheated and they got caught. All right, let's just be clear here. Did you notice kind of an intricate sort of little quirky thing about that report? How Two different candidates thought that they were the ones who got cheated here. Now, how is that possible, right? This was an election where one side has been caught stuffing the ballot box. And so what, the other two were a Republican and an independent? Is that what happened here? Is that why both of them feel like they got cheated? No, 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 no. No, this is an important part of the story. Both of those other candidates were also Democrats. See, this is Connecticut. Only Democrats are going to win the mayor's race in a city in Connecticut. So the real race happens during the primaries. See, those two candidates, they were competing against the incumbent mayor in a primary election to figure out who the Democrat nominee would be, who eventually would be the winner because Democrat Party control. So you get it, right? The only reason why we know about this, the only reason why there's been a prosecution, the only reason why there's any acknowledgement of voter fraud here is because the people who were complaining about it were Democrats. The victims were Democrats. 
If this happened in a general election and a Republican complained, he'd be arrested for insurrection. That's how it works, guys. The only time we're ever going to see anything in this country about exposing voter fraud is if a Democrat is on the losing end of the election. And that's exactly what happened here. We've seen the video. We've seen the fact that this person stuffed the box. You know, there was a time when this couldn't happen because you had to show up in person on election day, show your ID, and there were multiple eyes in the room watching you vote so that no shenanigans can take place. But over the course of the last several years, Democrats have decided that the best way to hold an election is via remote, via mail, via, via when no one's watching, except, thank God, this one security camera where this one ballot drop-off box was. And there's another jurisdiction run by Democrats where there were also huge outcries of voter fraud. And in this case, in this case, nothing happened. This was in California. This was during the recall election for Gavin Newsom as governor. Court and Rick, this is quite a story. Good question. What is going on? We spoke with several concerned voters here in the West San Fernando Valley who believe something wonky had been going on at places like El Camino Real Charter High School in Woodland Hills. This place opened up as an early polling location, open 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. daily. But several people tell us they showed up to vote this morning in the special California governor recall election and were told that computers showed they had already cast their ballots. So what? Staffers, they say, were apologetic and helpful, but those voters we talked to are extremely concerned, suspicious, and wanting answers. California native and current West Hills resident, 88-year-old Estelle Bender, spoke with us just a short time ago. What happened today and how shocked are you? Barry, I went to El Camino High School to vote, got there at 1030, gave her this, and she scanned it and said, you voted. And I said, no, I haven't. And she said, this has been happening all morning. The man next to me was arguing the same thing. So as I left, I did the provisional ballot. And I am just really angry. And I saw two women walking toward me as I left. And I said, don't be surprised if they tell you you've already voted. And she said, they've already done that. If I voted, how did I vote? And who did you vote for? Well, I asked the couple, the young women that I talked to, and I said, are you in, by any chance Republicans? She said, yes. And I said, well, so am I. And so are the two friends that had the problem at VFW. So. Makes you suspicious. I would think so. <laughs> and still, I'd like to know how I voted. All right, take a look. The L.A. County Registrar's Office released a statement tonight following our inquiries. A spokesman says the voters who experienced this issue were offered and provided a provisional ballot. And they said that the equipment was faulty and we've replaced the equipment and everything's fine, so pay no attention. And, of course, Gavin Newsom, well, it wasn't even close. He won in a landslide, so it doesn't really matter anyway. Move along, everyone. Just just move along. You didn't hear much about that story, did you? Well, there have been stories like this locally, and you can trust local news way more than you can trust national news based out of Manhattan and Washington, D.C., and the stories are there on a regular basis. And, and here's the real problem. It's echoed perfectly by our colleague Dennis Prager in a column at Town Hall this week. Yesterday, in fact, why American citizens mistrust election results more than the citizens of any other democracy. This really is fundamentally the problem, even more so than voter fraud. I, I know that 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 you probably see stories like this and, and you think that the real problem is that cheating is going on and Americans are being denied their vote and that the real winner 
is is kept out of office and the system is rigged. And, and listen, you may be right about that. But I think right now the biggest problem, truly the biggest problem in all of this is that none of us believe our elections are valid. See, for the democratic process to actually function properly in a constitutional republic that uses democracy to select our representatives, for it to work, we all have to have confidence in the system. If we don't, then it's chaos. And this has been a growing problem for years, and nothing is being done to fix it. And what's really, really frustrating is that we all know how to fix it. And the fact of the matter is there's only one political party in this country who at every turn resists obvious, well-known election security protocols. That's the Democrats. Every time you propose anything that would help secure our voting systems and give the American people confidence that our elections are not rigged, Democrats accuse you of racist voter suppression. Now, Dennis Prager, after pointing out the fact that in Europe, multiple countries just had elections and one thing was the same across all those nations, nobody claimed that they were fraudulent. Nobody claimed that the elections in Europe were rigged. Now, some might say because conservatives did well this time around, and it's only conservatives who ever complain about it. But of course, we know that's not true. And the fact is, for all the elections leading up to now in Europe, when the left wing did well, the right wing, the conservatives did not say this is fraudulent because they actually have protocols in place in Europe, protocols that we would envy and the Democrats in this country would call racist voter suppression. Let's scroll down a little bit here. Dennis Prager, the column's up right now at townhall.com. America is almost alone among democracies and not demanding that voters provide any identification when they vote. For some reason, the American left vehemently opposes voter ID. It claims voter ID is racist and that those who favor it are engaged in voter suppression. This is prima facie absurd. Are airports racist for demanding passenger identification? Does passenger ID result in passenger suppression? The most plausible reason the left opposes voter ID is to enable some degree of voter fraud. That's right. Go, go, go back to that California primary there for a minute. Think about it for a second. In California, the voter turnout is probably about the same, probably even less than most other states because it's a one-party state. I don't blame Republicans for feeling feeling like there's no reason to vote in that state. So let's say they've got 35% turnout. That's probably generous, right? And of the 35% turnout they have, only about 30% of those people who turn out to vote are probably Republican, right? So think about that for a second. One third of one third of the registered voters actually show up to vote. That means you've got a vast majority of registered voters, especially registered Republicans, who you can roll the dice and suspect, yeah, they're not going to show up. They're not going to vote. So the odds are very much in your favor to just cast a ballot for them. Who's going to know? There's no voter idea with those drop boxes. There's no voter ID for mail-in ballots. Hell, there's no voter ID when it's three in the afternoon and the polling place is empty and nobody's looking. Let's just start checking off these Republican voters. They haven't shown up yet, so they're probably not going to show up and we'll just vote for them. That's why when Republicans show up to vote, suddenly they find out, what do you mean I've already voted? I'm right here. I haven't voted. How did this happen? It must have been a machine malfunction. Now, listen, the scenario I just painted for you could have happened. There's no evidence that it did happen. But the fact that it could have happened is the problem. Because after the election occurs and you hear one or two anecdotal stories about that, you suddenly become suspicious and you suddenly think that the whole system is rigged. So even if it's not happening, a responsible state, a responsible government a responsible constitutional republic that wants to assuage the fears and concerns of the populace will put protocols in place 
where they can say it's impossible, that sort of thing will never happen. And yet we don't. Back to Dennis Prager. If that is not the reason, voter fraud, isn't it enormously irresponsible to cultivate doubts about election integrity among half its country citizens for no valid reason? Moreover, in no other country does its left oppose voter ID. That's right. America is almost alone among Democratic countries in not requiring paper ballots. As of 2023, only Brazil counts all its ballots in national elections through electronic voting. According to Pew Research, votes are cast by manually marking paper ballots in 209 of the 227 countries. In France, as reported by the Associated Press, voters use the same system that's been used for generations, paper ballots that are cast in person and counted by hand. In 2009, Germany's federal constitutional court ruled that voting machines could no longer be used. In 2017, the Dutch government announced that all ballots on the 2017 general election would be counted by hand. And guess what? In those countries, they actually have the election results within three, four, five hours of the polls closing because they take this seriously. You should read the whole article at Town Hall. But the bottom line is this. You get in trouble if you even make oblique suggestions that there may have been voter fraud in this country in the past. I mean, unless you're Hillary Clinton or Jamie Raskin or Nancy Pelosi or Joe Biden or Al Gore or Terry McAuliffe or Bill Clinton or, well, you get the picture. You get in terrible hot water and you're called many nasty names and you end up on the FBI watch list for some reason or another that doesn't this time involve going to the traditional Latin mass. But let's be real here. Whether there is voter fraud or whether there isn't voter fraud, the majority of the countries on this planet, and I mean the vast majority, like over 95% of functioning democracies or countries that use democracy to elect their representatives like ours, over 95% of them have hand-counted, paper ballots where you have to show ID to vote. And those countries all have one thing in common. They don't have people who walk away at the end of election day with a shadow of doubt whether that election was legit or not. And we, the people of the United States of America, what's supposed to be the shining beacon of freedom and liberty, self-rule, and a constitutional republic that utilizes democracy, we deserve at least that. And you have to ask yourself, why don't we have that? Why don't we follow those same basic protocols? And the only conclusion you can reach at this point is that those who are keeping us from having that peace of mind, those people want us paranoid. They want us angry. They want us divided. It serves them. And that's despicable. Actor Kevin Spacey has, well, been through some pretty rough news cycles. But it should be pointed out that despite the assumption right now by most people on the planet Earth that Kevin Spacey is a sexual predator, he's actually never been found guilty of any crimes in that regard. Now, I don't know one way or the other because I haven't been party to any of Kevin Spacey's behavior. I don't know whether he's guilty or not. I can only tell you that through our system of legal justice, Kevin Spacey is a free man. And he's never had to pay, you know, big time penalties in a civil lawsuit that I'm aware of. If I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments. Kevin Spacey showed up on Piers Morgan's show. It's the uncensored show that he does exclusively for streaming video. And he had a lot of stories to tell about what he's been through over the last several years. And it turns out, shockingly, or not so shockingly, that the moment things started to get bad for Kevin Spacey and uh, the story started to emerge and unravel for him was around the same time the Jeffrey Epstein story was surfacing in our nation. What's the connection? Well, here's Kevin Spacey talking to Piers Morgan. In 2015, I started seeing reports online, things on my Twitter account that 
I had flown to this guy, Jeffrey Epstein's island, and I had abused young girls. And I was like, I mean, if you'd asked me in 2015, maybe even if you'd asked me in 2002, did I know a guy named Jeffrey Epstein? I probably would have said no. Well, of course, I have since learned who he is. And I have since been able to go back and find out that the airplane that we flew on for this humanitarian mission was owned by Jeffrey Epstein. And to then learn, oh, he was actually on some of those flights. And this Maxwell woman was on some of those flights. I didn't know him. I've never spent any time with him. I was with the Clinton Foundation people. That's who I was with. Now, the, what I understand is that he didn't start to be investigated until 2005 by authorities in Florida. Mm -hmm. So here's what I can tell you. <clears throat> this Maxwell woman, she was one of many people who sat down next to me in that throne room. I, I have no relationship with her. I had no relationship with him. I mean, he's not my friend. I'm not a confidant. I've never spent time with him. A and interestingly, I, I, I will say this. I was very fortunate that President Clinton introduced me a lot of business leaders in London because he knew I was coming to the old Vic. And I developed relationships with Robert Earl, Pula Lodobovic, the, the, uh, um, Robert Earl, a lot of wonderful people, uh, Sir Richard Caring, people who supported the work that we did at the Old Vic and gave money to us. Do you know who I never asked for anything? It was Jeffrey Epstein. I didn't want to be around this guy because I felt he put the president at risk on that trip to South Africa because there were these young girls. And we were like, what? who is this guy? So I will say this. There were young girls on those flights. There were young girls on those flights, yeah. All right. So uh, that's quite a revelation, isn't it? I mean, we always assumed this, but uh, just to sort of reorder what was going on here, uh, Kevin Spacey w was an Oscar-winning actor, Hollywood film. He started in theater, and he was hired to be the producing artistic director of The Old Vic. You heard him mentioning The Old Vic. That is a nonprofit theater organization in London. Uh, they've got a long history. They've done great work. And so, of course, Kevin Spacey starts to network because when you run a nonprofit theater, you spend the majority of your time not producing art and putting on Shakespeare. You spend the majority of your time raising money. And a lot of times it's about uh, hobnobbing with one or two really wealthy, well-connected people because it's a lot easier to make one deal with one person who will write a check for a million dollars than it is to make a hundred acquaintances that'll each give you ten thousand dollars you know it's still a million dollars but it's one dinner instead of a hundred dinners right so kevin spacey as a lifelong democrat and a friend of the democrat party at the highest levels well he hobnobs and weasels his way into the clinton foundation he's thinking to himself i got to get myself a couple of rich donors here for my theater company, I'm going to call up my friend, Bill Clinton, and maybe I can get to know some of the people who are working with his foundation, and I'll peel a few of them over to my nonprofit. The next thing you know, he's on a plane doing a humanitarian trip to South Africa. And it turns out it was Jeffrey Epstein's plane. And there were young girls all over the place. And Kevin Spacey observes everything, sees it all going on freaking out about something that's happening. And this is where my speculation gets to go into play. Kevin Spacey, as you just heard him say there, says that uh, he went and followed up with a good handful of people that he met there, but he never followed up with Jeffrey Epstein because he weirded him out, right? He didn't follow up with Jeffrey Epstein. He wouldn't have anything to do with him because he saw what was going on on the plane. Now, interestingly, uh, the fact that there were rumors out there that Kevin Spacey had had sex with underage girls because he was associated with Jeffrey Epstein, we know that that can't be true because Kevin Spacey, in fact, is gay. All of the allegations against Kevin Spacey uh, that he's been cleared of, and I, I just want to be sure here, uh, he has acknowledged, and he did acknowledge in this interview, that he was too handsy sometimes backstage. But every single lawsuit against him whether it was civil or in any way penal, um, poor choice of words, 
<laughs> Every single one of the cases against Kevin Spacey that have been tried in a court of law, he has been found not guilty or not responsible or not liable for any sexual misconduct. And they all involve men. They all involve boys. So here's Kevin Spacey on the Epstein plane. And it's a bunch of young girls all around. And this is where my speculation and my reading between the lines comes in. It had to be clear to any observer, and I'm guessing Jeffrey Epstein was a keen observer of the characters that were on his planes. I'm sure that when Jeffrey Epstein had all of these very well-connected, powerful, famous, wealthy people exposed to his disgusting, satanic, demonic, sinful debauchery, I'm sure Jeffrey Epstein spent close attention to how the individuals on those planes reacted. And here's Kevin Spacey, a gay man, reacting in probably a less than favorable way. So my speculation, Jeffrey Epstein's whole job was not pimping girls. That was just the means to an end. His job was to get dirt on people and then threaten to destroy them. And he knew that Kevin Spacey was going to be a liability because Kevin Spacey, he couldn't get any dirt on that, on him because he wasn't playing along like Bill Clinton was. And it wasn't very long after that incident that suddenly all the allegations about Kevin Spacey that ended up ruining his career and ruining him, they all surfaced. We may never know if Jeffrey Epstein was behind all of that, because, you know, Jeffrey Epstein's no longer with us. He committed suicide. Yeah, sure he did. But Kevin Spacey, Kevin Spacey in this interview for Piers Morgan, bared all, so to speak, about how all of these allegations have absolutely devastated him, ruined him. And I want to reiterate, whether you like Kevin Spacey or not, based on the way we go about things legally in our country, this man has done no wrong, no legal wrong. But look at what they've done to him. Where'd you live now? Uh, well, it's funny you ask that question because this week uh, where I have been living in Baltimore uh, is being foreclosed on. It, my house is being sold at auction. Really? So I have to go back to uh, to Baltimore and, and put all my things in storage. Really? So the answer to that question is, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to live uh, uh, now, but I've been in Baltimore for um, since we started shooting House of Cards there. So how long is that? I moved there in 2012. So you, this has been your home for 12 years? Well, not this particular place, but this place has been my home and Evan and Lucy's home uh, since 2016. Why is it being foreclosed? Because I can't pay the bills that I owe. Are you, I mean, are you facing bankruptcy? Uh, been a couple of times when I thought I was going to file, but we've managed to sort of dodge it, um, at least uh, as of today. How much money do you have? None. Really? Well, I mean, you know, you have some sense of legal bills. Yeah. I, I still owe a lot of legal bills that you're I have not been in, able to pay. You're actually in debt? Yes. Do you mind me asking how much you owe? It's, uh, it's considerable. Millions? Many millions, yes. The what? house itself is many millions. What are you going to do? Get back on the horse. Get back on the horse. It's um, it's quite an interview, and you should watch the whole thing. No matter how you feel about Kevin Spacey, honestly, this is an incredibly human story playing out before our eyes. And the fact that it involves the Clintons, Jeffrey Epstein, Hollywood and sexuality, and, and again, a man who, you know, maybe they're going to find him guilty of some kind of sexual misconduct, but honestly... 
considering the other things that we know that go on in Hollywood and the stuff that has been proven. And if I could bring us back to the Hunter Biden story, all of the things that we've seen he involved his involvement in on that laptop when it comes to sexual deviancy. And he hasn't been charged with anything. But Kevin Spacey is a ruined man. It does make you wonder and it makes you think. And it's one of the things we try to do here on this show every day is to make you think, just think, instead of just immediately presupposing what you already believe about someone or about something. When you actually see the person, hear the person, find out the story and find out that the Jeffrey Epstein and Bill Clinton and the plane full of young girls that clearly disgusted Kevin Spacey at the time. And he snubbed and shunned. I mean, don't you think Jeffrey Epstein now gets to tell me, hey, you know, guess who was on the plane? Oscar winner Kevin Spacey. You want to be impressed? God, I'll, I'll call him right now and we'll get him on the plane for the next trip. And Kevin Spacey snubs him. Kevin Spacey ignores him. Kevin Spacey doesn't play the game. And the next thing you know, Kevin Spacey's life is ruined. It kind of makes you want to pull a little more on those threads, doesn't it? It kind of makes you want to know more information about how many powerful people were involved there and what kind of damage all those powerful people who are trying to protect themselves, what kind of damage they can do to an individual if they want to. I hope we've made you think a second time on this. That's it for today. We'll be back next time. But in the meantime, I'm Larry O'Connor. You can call me Larry. Larry.